Ahem. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 198. Uno nueve ocho. Uno nueve ocho. How are you guys doing? Good. Good to know you're well. Good to know you're good. I'm feeling pretty good. Pretty, um, all things considered, feeling well. I've just had my nice breakfast. I'm going to have a little run later on today, a little nice five-mile run in a baking hot sun today, so wish me luck with that endeavor. But yeah, feeling nice, feeling great, just before work, um, putting up a little podcast as we usually do during the week. Today's week, today's um, podcast routine or podcast schedule hasn't been as... Um, hasn't been as uh, on point as the last previous weeks, right? I've, I've done about, I think the last few weeks, I've done probably about four episodes a week, which has been pretty um, good experience. But I think overall, maybe the um, overall output has maybe dipped a bit as well. The quality of them maybe has dipped a bit because I'm doing them so regularly. Maybe a little gap in between is quite advantageous. But, you know, I think it's really important in the beginning when you're doing these things to kind of go hard as you can, as hard as you can in the paint. And then um, the more successful or the more, you know, um, yeah, the more successful you become, then you can start to then maybe level out a little bit and then start to build a bit of a structure and a schedule. But I think for now, I have loads to talk about. I have loads to share. There's always stuff on the internet to, you know, people to look at. And I guess, especially in the podcast world, having checked some of my other things that I listen to and subscribe to, there's loads of podcasts that are still hovering around the like 200 or 300 episode mark, which obviously, you know, for some of them, it makes sense because most of them rely on, um, they rely on the model of interviewing guests and stuff, but I don't actually do that. You know, I've never had a guest on here and probably won't in the near future. Um, seeing something on my own and it's a solo thing, I can get away. I, I think I can get away with being a little bit more cavalier in terms of how many I do and how often I put them out. I think that's the most important thing to do overall going forward. Um, podcast um, little updates for on your side for you guys listening or watching. I'm going to get a new camera very very soon to kind of update the camera that I have here. The camera I have, I'm using at the moment is just a standard like Logitech um, webcam that I got you know cheap off of Amazon. So I'm just going to try and get that uh, going forward. Then I'm going to improve the microphone i'm using now the microphones are kind of cheap um usb mic that i picked up from amazon that i'm obviously going to update as well and give that a little bit of a spruce hopefully i'll then i think i'm going to invest in a sound card as well so i can you know adjust the volume and the gains whatever and maybe have some um, monitor headphones i can wear as well but sometimes they get a bit sweaty but you know i have to get a specific kind of studio monitors and then that'll be it for the most part i think we're still going to be moving we're still going to move hopefully um very soon to another place somewhere near or oh, around where we kind of live for the interim part before we then make the leap over to Manchester or wherever our location we go to. Um, so that will be that will be good because then I'll be able to have another room where I can like kind of quote, set up a studio and not have to do it in my living room with kind of limited space because every time I have to do the podcast, set some so I set it up and then kind of set it you know dress it down again. So that gets a bit annoying. And of course, with it being in another room in in my in my um, place, it will then save on costs in terms of renting out another place. So that will be um, even more advantageous. So yeah, those are the two updates that will be coming at you very soon. So if you see an uptake in quality of the actual camera, which I'm going to be happy to with, and you see the uh, an uptake in quality in terms of my um overall audio that um then you know why that happened because i went out and invested in a camera and a microphone i probably should have got it a long time ago you know I've, the amount of it's funny the amount of money or the amount of time we waste in not getting the resources that we need when we need them but then we are really cavalier in how we spend money in other ways right we, we spend money easily we just throw it around in other stupid endeavors but when it comes to actually doing the for the things that you actually need like i don't know you need a new phone so you can take pictures of your things or you need to buy a new camera to take pictures of wherever you take pictures of photography wise you need a, a speaker you need this whatever equipment you need it always takes a lot of while, a lot long, long for you to get that than it would do to you to buy you know another fucking check shirt in my case or whatever other nonsense that's out there so um yeah lesson learned that way you know make sure you get the things that you need and don't faff around what else has been happening oh DJing, DJing, DJing. It's hotting up these last couple of days, of course, because, you know, bank holiday Monday next week and the sun is shining. Everyone wants someone to play. I've got a pretty, I've got a pretty hectic schedule coming up at the moment. So um, I think I've just agreed to DJ um, next week and I'm DJing again on a Monday too. So for this weekend, think, look, look, here this schedule, right? This is for somebody coming up, you know, doing their own thing and trying to make a little move here and there. I'm DJing tonight, Friday at Tapis, right? At Westfield. I'm DJing tomorrow at the Leighton Stone, at the Heathcote and Star in Leighton Stone. I'm DJing again on Monday back at Tapis for a like, little, you know, little bank holiday Monday vibes. Then I'm DJing again on Thursday 
at the three campuses in Dawson. So I'm DJing one, two, three, four times um, across those kind of next two weeks. It's going to be an absolutely crazy jam-packed week. And then, of course, sorry, I'm DJing five times. It's the 24th, the 25th, the 27th, the 30th, and the 31st. All back to, no, not back to back, like, you know, um, all concurrently happening along the next couple of weeks and so. So that's going to be a pretty stressful um, schedule, but something I'm looking forward to. You know, I've always had a dream of, doing this kind of thing professionally and now people are paying me you know nominal m- amounts of money you know it's not really for the money it's more so for the exposure and for the experience of it being able to do these sort of uh, being able to play out in front of people is a really hard to do um because for the most part you know bars and clubs tend to have their people who they lock down and tend to use the same people again and again and again which i, I kind of understand but for a new dj that myself or for somebody or for punters we want to hear somebody a little bit interesting it's a little bit uh, it could be a little bit frustrating because you get to hear you don't necessarily get to see new people you just have to hear the same old same old because you know they have a relationship with the bar owner or the booking person so it's harder for someone like me to kind of get your foot in the door but as with all things once you do get your foot in the door you just have to fucking work your ass off to make sure that you don't get out of it right that you're that you stay in it for instance and also the good thing about it is that even though people are quite clicky with who they um, bring in and stuff it can work to your advantage too because when you if you prove yourself that you know that you're good at what you do that you can handle yourself well that you can read the, the crowd well you can appeal to a wider audience those people will then go and recommend you to other people because you know there is a sh- as much as people like to say oh everyone's a dj that is very true but there's not as they, because everyone's a dj the talent pool is a little bit diluted there's not as many good djs so which is why you see for the most part the people that are performing at right at the top tier, right? The guys and girls who are playing now at Circo Loco and DC10, um, or Circo Loco DC10 or in Abifa for this whole season, the people that are going to be playing across all the main festivals, those five or those that 10 to 5% of DJs uh, are earning like, you know, the big, big, big bucks. And then the ones underneath are just, you know, kind of like, you know, just above what we're are kind of earning wise, you know, or maybe yeah, earning wise, maybe talent ability, but the top five to 10%, there is a reason why they're up there. Like, and you only have to check out a recent mix I listened to now with um, Gerdy Anson at Boiler Room. You know, a DJ that a lot of kind of DJs are big fans of. He's the quintessential DJ's DJ. And that set he played recently, I think it was like an, a Belgian open air festival or something. Check it out. It's on Boiler Room YouTube now at the moment. It's really, really amazing. And then off the back of that, you've got the recent um, mix with uh, Solomon. Uh, he did a, he did a performance during, I think a, Cirque, I think it's a French production company called Circa or Circle or something like that. Um, they do like these amazing, amazing, amazing um, uh, gigs where they place them in some crazy scenarios. There was one where they had um, they had a DJ playing in a chalet somewhere at the top of the French Alps. They have it in deserts. They have them in castles. And basically, this video is a um, a video of Solomon DJing at a festival just as on the courtyards of a massive sort of like um, palace or whatever it may be called. So I definitely recommend check that out. But the, when you see those guys play, you rec- you realize okay, cool. There's levels to this shit, but it's also you know. That, that again is another it's another version of what I'm going through you know because it's the same people playing in the same festivals but there's a reason why because they know they bring the they bring the fucking pain and if you if you're gonna if you're gonna book if you're gonna book them woman at a moment like Peggy Goo and those kind of people uh Amelia Lenz Sark the Wit you know they're gonna bring it right they, there's no um risk there the Black Madonna those kind of people you know they're gonna the Honey Dijon they're gonna bring it regardless so I think as annoying as it can be that it's hard to get in you know because everyone's kind of closing their doors no one replies back to you message wise when you try and reach out and see if you can get a little spot somewhere I I understand too right you don't want to take the chance of going for some a stranger you don't know they come in and they end up playing I don't know EDM for like four hours and you know and I, and I can imagine how awkward it must be for a bar manager to go up to a DJ and tell them look what you're playing is shit can you change up a little bit it can be a little bit difficult to do that so I definitely understand where they're coming from Anyway, um, what else is going on in my life? That's about it for the most part. Oh, I'm going to Paris is actually in the next couple of weeks too. That should be very much some fun. Oh, you know what's oh you know what's happening actually? Um, forget Paris Junction too. So going to that next next couple of weeks too. That should be fucking cool. Can't wait to, for that to happen. I think Junction have just released the timetables as well for the festivals, um, which is awesome. They don't usually do that. Um, well, these kind of festivals, they usually take a while to release them because they want to make sure people buy tickets, right? So they kind of always withhold the set times. So people can buy tickets. They don't want anyone to just come and buy it. It's weird. London festivals and club nights resist releasing set times ahead of time because they don't want people just to buy tickets for to see the particular person they want to see. Strange, right? Um, they want to make sure they get the monies in. But then um, 
some places it's straight because I think for the most part if you're gonna go if you're gonna go you're gonna go regardless you're not you're not going just because you want to see a certain you want to go see a collection of people and person like me who's maybe a little bit more picky and would want to go see a particular DJ I'm still gonna give you the money for the full nights of a party right even if I want to see Ricardo Villalobos only play or I want to see Ricardo Villalobos and Mercy drum ensemble I'm still giving that festival the day ticket rate right I'm not just going there and purchasing a ticket for the two hours that that DJ is on so I never understand that kind of thinking um because you know you don't the other thing as well you'd never really get secret lineup um gigs in the uk that much that often because you know for the most part our license laws are quite shit so bars and nightclubs don't really have a big window to sell alcohol to make money at the bar so they can't afford to have a secret lineup right they just can't afford it they have to let people know who's playing so the hope is people will get excited buy the tickets in advance and it'll sell out and then they already have covered a bit of their nut with the, on the gates and then they know they're going to get a lot of people coming in which is going to guarantee bar bar t- bar um takes gonna be really good so i get it but with festivals i don't understand it because the lineup's already released ahead of time anyway i know who's going to be playing and if i spot someone i like i'm going to buy a ticket anyway so it's like you've already made your money so I don't really understand why they don't release the set times. But anyway, that that is um another rant for another day. But um Junction Two have uh, Junction Two have released their set time. It's it's some it's part of an app that I just downloaded recently, just now actually. It's called um what's it called? It's called Woo or something. It's called Wov W O O V Woo Wov. But yeah, Junction Two is happening. I can't fucking wait. Uh, Junction 2 London's Hidden Festival Friday the 7th uh, and Saturday the 8th of June Boston Manor so just west of London if you're familiar with the area and the lineup is fucking awesome the Friday lineup is probably one I'd probably want to go to most out of this I got tickets for the weekend but if I was going to decide and say you know what's the time I want to go just going to see the Friday main stage you've got Bicep um, Daphne Giles Peterson Mr. G and Fort Ramu um, on the bridge You've got Ricardo Villalobos, Craig Richards, Dixon, DJ Coz, uh, Joe Jobis, and Says. On the stretch, front of the stage, you've got Honey, Mercy, and Drum Ensemble, Jeremy Underground, Carista, and Peach. On the warehouse, you've got Daniel Avery, Object, DJ Stingray, um, Umfag, uh, Back to Back of Volvex, Batu. In the woods, you've got Ben UFO, Core Super, Shanti Celeste, um, uh, Roxy Moore, and Rini. And on Saturday, you've got some great back-to-backs. You've got, on the main stage, you've got Master Max- Max- Pex going back-to-back with Taylor of Us. You've got Master Max- Pex on his own and Taylor of Us. And you've got Max Cooper and Val. Then you've got Adam Bayer, Richie Horton at the bridge um, with Joseph um, Capriati, um, Ida Inberg, and Bart Skills. Then the stretch, uh, Ida Inberg is really good as well. I recommend you check her out. She's amazing. She's uh, one of the female leaders out there hasn't really been getting as much love as everyone else at the moment. I'm not sure what's going on, but she's awesome. I forgot who she's, who's the other DJ she's married to. I forgot his name. But yeah. Um, then on the on the stretch sound stage on Saturday, they've got Loco Dice, Apollina, Lauren Lasug, and uh, Gene on Earth. That's going to be fucking loud as fuck. <laughs> Warehouse uh, venue, they've got Amelia Lenz, Dax J. Then it's Pika, Etap Kyle, Mogan, and the Woods, they've got Sonia Monet. Nicholas Lotz, Craig Richards, San Proper, and Voitman. So yeah, um, just absolutely mad, mad, mad lineup. Like honestly, it's going to be probably one of the best ones um they've done of recent years. Again, the opportunity to see someone like a Ricardo Villalobos and a Dixon and a Master Plex and a Tale of Us, like all playing in one lineup. Adam Bayer, Richie Horton, like we have haven't seen in Yonks. It's fucking insane. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. So again, if you're an electronic music fan and you're in and around the area and you're there and you see my massive head, say hi, give us a wave. I'll be there throwing shapes with the rest of you absolute psychos. What else is happening in my sphere? Actually, you've got loads of topics to talk about. I've got loads of topics, loads of things to rattle through. Loads and loads and loads. Number one thing I want to rattle through is this news I've just seen on Hypebeast. Um, seeing as it is Streetwear Fridays, I think, right? Streetwear Fridays today, but anyway, let's go with that. Uh, StockX is to open a physical location, create, did create, did dedicated to buy page and sell collectibles. So news from Hypebeast. Now at the moment, um, as reported by um, W wwd magazine right that's the fashion business kind of mag let's get some news up here on the screen there it goes so got up in the physical location which you know makes perfect sense with the way the business is going um and it says here the following as reported stockx is making um, m- some major moves after expanding outside of north america in late 2018 the stock market of things will open its first ever physical storefront in new york city revealed that the third annual stock day event the company announced several major updates including a new nyc outpost and forthcoming vertical uh, dedicated to selling collectibles essentially i already existed our customer wanted more of it says geo ceo just luber 
Lube also recently contributed to our landmark streetwear impact report. Continued as primary, pri- as primary, as primary, as primarily a web business. Fucking up, my my um, features fucked up. It's great to be closer to our customers and engage with them. We're excited to have New York as our first location. This follows a company series of American pop ups, which included a stop in New York, and I think they did one here too, right in um, London. Um, the article continues soon users will be able to buy and sell beer bricks cause figures and more via a review page on the site a beer a new page instead of sifting through the other brands tab luba did yet didn't yet reveal a date for the new page nor did he confirm the opening day of stockett's new storefront in 237 lafayette street however the company did state that it will launch a fifth authentication center located in the netherlands and collaborate on an initial product offering in chinatown market the other so okay awesome sneak stuff up in here so stockers are launching a physical space and i don't know it's interesting because i think there's another youtuber i forgot his name who's also launched his own kind of physical location it's just interesting to see where sneaker industry is heading you know it's it being a billion dollar industry but it really i think it sits on kind of shaky foundations if it's my estimation right because i think sneaker culture isn't really what sneaker culture it sneaker culture isn't what i envisioned it to be and i think sometimes the market gets it a bit fucked up because from my limited experience or knowledge it seems that sneaker industry has only been propped up by the reselling market there's not an actual culture behind it and i say that because not from any kind of point of snobbery or that you know i'm a better collector than other people but i just say that from the point of like the times that you know when i me when i when i grew up and i got into sneakers you know my first exposure to them was you know through like the crooked tongues forum rip you know one of the best kind of um online communities for collecting shoes just talking about shit it's just like a really cool group of people in the beginning it was a bit difficult you know because i, I don't know we were maybe the first wave of young kids that propped up that popped up on the market and a lot of the guys on there were like in their early 20s early 30s so they were like you know grown-up adults who had kind of been doing the damn thing for a while we came in all bushy all bushy-tailed wide-eyed and it kind of gave us a bit of shit right and i think it happens more often than we'd like to think it does and or maybe not i think the kids on basement are pretty chill isn't it the kids on basement they're they're pretty nice to each other i just think you know i just grew up in a time where people were being a bit snarky right it's like um i'd imagine skate i'd imagine them um, skate parks are a lot better are a lot warmer of a of a place now than they were when i first went to a skate park right you felt super intimidated even just going to a skate shop at slam city skates right they used to be you know they used to be such dicks to you if they didn't know who you are they really hazed you really kind of run you through the ringer before they accepted okay you were in it for the love and you weren't trying to you know just go in and trying to you know earn cool points fair enough but anyway when i used to when i grew up in um when i when i was growing up and i got into sneakers the thing was, we we got into it for the love of sneakers, right? It wasn't necessarily just because of hype items. Yes, when SBs came along, it kind of messed things up a little bit and some tier zero shoes. But for the most part, people were going out of their way to find dead stock heat for like. And when they said dead stock heat, they didn't mean like they didn't mean a brand new pair of Yeezys. They meant an an item that no one else has that's dead stock and that's amazing. That's what dead stock heat came from. That kind of eternal phrase, what I um, remember it being. But then, of course, over the years, you know. Um, the brands recognized the uh, appeal and the money making aspect of limited edition shoes and decided to churn them out right i think it kind of i saw the change in it come from you know the year of the dog or the chinese new year sort of um shoe that was a little bit of an add-on that no one really gave a shit about and then suddenly nike started to recognize how you know important that kind of shoe was to the asian market how important it was to the recent market and now sorry about surely the value or the attention or you know the amount of detail or the amount of marketing budget that goes into promoting that shit that shoe every year is insane and i can't remember a good one for the life of me right the chinese new year um nike you know air force whatever they go on and making so it being propped up on just resale market it kind of makes me think that if the resale market goes away will sneaker culture even exist will kids care i don't know if they will i don't know if they really will because you only have to go to um one of those, you know, in real life StockX or sneaker reselling um, market things to realize that people only really give a shit, especially kids nowadays, about limited edition shoes. The, the the guy that's got the store with all the quote unquote heat is the one that's really selling all the, is selling the most stuff. The guy that's selling like really great, you know, GR shoes that are now hard to get or shoes that people that flew under the radar that no one was really hyping. They're, they're the ones that don't really make any money whatsoever or don't get their kind of, you know, social media um photograph um instagram picture reportage on no one's really taking pictures of somebody's um store that's full of like you know air max 90s they picked up from jd sports back in the day that equally as you know 
heat worthy as anything else right if somebody had a store full of you know infrareds from 2002 and laser blues and all that sort of stuff or infrared 90s and laser blue 90s from 2002 that i'd think that's a good store but for some people it's not and again that's the thing that kind of bums me out a little bit about the sneakerhead community now at the moment it's a little bit too much relying on um hype and of course you know the sneaker brands have a responsibility for that too because they feed into it but i think by and large the consumer nowadays just wants the most limited and hard to get shoe which kind of again goes against what being a sneaker addict or being a fan of sneakers is actually all about but hey ho what do i know so i'm interested to see what the store's going to do because in the future because again because if this if the hype goes away StockX doesn't exist then does it really because why would you want to go i don't know like they just go like it just turns into like a good hood right it just turns into like an end clothing or like a sense just selling trainers just saying general trainer people want to buy the whole reason why StockX exists or why it is what it is or go all these other places is because hype shoes are around and you only have to look at StockX to see how you know the um, the effect that they've had on the stock mar- on the resale market has been incredible, right? The prices of re- the prices of limited edition shoes has never been lower since StockX has been around. You know, it kind of because everyone's got, everyone's got the ability to buy a shoe. That you know, they're all you know. There's more there's more availability of these shoes available on the market because they're easier to sell. You have to sell them on eBay and have to do all that nonsense. I don't know, man. I don't know if it goes away. Like these guys are absolutely fucked, really, for the most part, aren't they? But you know. Maybe they know something I don't, but let's see what happens with a new location. It could, it's only going to be, again, I, I come on here and complain about the lack of stores that we have in terms of streetwear. We don't really have any destinations to go to and just, you know, catch a vibe, feel something, um, hear someone speak. I don't know, just how it used to be before. You know, as, as wanky as those places are, as much as I hate some of the people that frequent them, there was something quite nice and appealing about being in a sneaker space with other sneaker fans as well, sharing that communal space, you know, the, catching a vibe, you know, and just generally having somewhere to go to kind of meet new people that are into the thing that you're into, which is a, a, an extreme, specific niche of an interest to be into. So to be find someone that's like, like like something that you like, and you know, you can share a little glass of you know, um, warm red stripe. That was a way to go for me on most um, Thursday evenings. But yeah, let's see what they do. Hopefully, they, I'm assuming they're going to open one in London too, and other locations where they have offices. It probably make more sense, and they can kind of go on from there. Probably double up as a good little office space as well, and for some of their team as well. But yeah, that's news I just saw at the moment. I thought I'd kind of, you know, sprinkle in there for your liking. Um, what's next here? Um, men need to chill out. What is this? This is an interesting topic, probably, right? That I remember, I don't remember putting on here. What did I say about this? It's an article from the Hollywood Reporter about Jason Mitchell being dropped from the shy a Netflix film and amid misconduct allegations. Yeah, this is just a, another one of those stories that's a bit oh, a bit soul destroying, really, isn't it? Um, but hey ho ho, let's read it and see what he has to say. So Jason Mitchell, a, an actor from The Shy, I'm assuming, right? If, do, do you guys watch that? It's on Netflix at the moment, or The She. Um, a source of knowledge of, to, of the Showtime series says Tiffany Bone, who played the straight out Compton star's girlfriend, was among several actresses on the drama who had issues with the actor. God almighty, several actresses. I, I wonder at what time, at what point of you be doing your dirtbag ways, or not even your creeper ways with girls that you work with, and, you know, I'm assuming they call you out. The problem is that they don't call you Do they owe you a call out? Probably not, not even if you're being a creep. But anyway, let's imagine they do They do call you out on it. At what point does your sense making that break is kicking and say, you know what, I need to chill out, man. These girls, you know, they, they, they let me know where they stand. They don't want me to do what I'm doing. I should just relax and leave them alone. They just continue, continue, continue pestering. There must be something really fucked up with you if you do that. Anyway, there must be something fucked up with you. But anyway, let's continue with the story. Um, in the wake of multiple applica- application allegations of misconduct, straight out of Compton star Jason Mitchell has been terminated by his agent and manager and dropped from his Showtime shy, Showtime the shy and upcoming Netflix uh, film The Desperados. That is essentially the Hollywood blackball, isn't it? Like that's you done from the industry because those f- those two people by your side are the ones that basically dictate how you're going to what your trajectory is in this kind of industry which is weird considering the internet and all that sort of stuff managers and agents are still really important right in terms of connections and where they place you i know i know from just the stories that i've read about djs and what they kind of and their trajectory right it's usually the same kind of thing that i'm doing playing in local bars and clubs putting mixes up online um playing in one bar or club or festival be recognized by somebody then booking you on another big lineup and then from their representation might see you and want to represent you and all of a sudden they can then place you in places because they have the connections so they're really important in hollywood it's even more so because you know you only hear the story i only hear the stories third hand through podcasts but hollywood is super interconnected right it's incestuous it's interconnected it's really clicky if you you know you have to be standing with the right people in order to kind of get where you want to get to if you're in the industry or the only other thing that you can do is be a joe rogan and just you know 
appeal to your own core niche be your own man and you can say and do what the fuck you want but when you get dropped like that that's literally like the mark of death in it no one wants to come near you anymore i'd imagine um showtimes netflix and fox 21 also which producer should i decline to comment a source of knowledge of showtime series says that tiffany boone who played mitchell's girlfriend on the on the show was among several actresses on the series who had issues with mitchell she made respected complaints repeated complaints of sexual harassment and allegedly felt so unsafe with her co-star that at times her fiance dear white people actor marquis richardson came on set when she shot scenes with him bone declined to comment mama mia imagine being her, her boyfriend and hearing this, right? Like you're you're at home chilling. Your work, your your girlfriend comes home. Hey babe, what's up, man? You're at right? work. She's all moody and sad and shit. And you're having to like ask her what's up. Hey, what's going on, man? Like you have to really try and dig out, but she doesn't want to tell you because you know she knows what that does to a guy, like his brain, right? How, how that's gonna affect him, how he's gonna react. She probably just you know again because women are t- women can be s- too sensible for these kind of scenarios, which is why I think why creepo guys prey on some vulnerable women to try and like get you know sexual favors from them because women can be really pragmatic and and patient with these kind of issues they can think about things from loads of different perspectives when really they should be thinking about it from their own right and just try and be selfish and protect themselves to make sure they don't end up in fucked up situations but they can think about the the staff and the members or the or the kind of crew right she thinks oh if this guy sexually assaults me and i complain um, and I make a big deal out about it. They're going to cancel the show. And if they cancel the show, this woman that does my makeup and has got four kids is going to be out of a job. And if that guy does, you know what I mean? You're thinking about so many different things. You're thinking about your agent who went, who went, uh, uh, you know, who fought tooth and nail to get you on the show. You're thinking about your boyfriend and, you know, how happy he was about you getting the program. You're thinking about your mom and how glad she was. You're thinking about all these things that are going to crumble from your allegation of what you say, but you're not thinking about how much, how detrimental it is to your mental and physical well-being that this guy you know is making unwanted sexual approaches to you it's really heinous it's really really disgusting the more you start to read really stories the more you start to understand why it's so prevalent because you know a, a neanderthal brain thing to think about it would be like oh why don't these girls just walk away why don't they just complain why don't you just call the police right that's the easy way to go about things like, this, is, this is ridiculous like if this happened to me like quote unquote me as a guy you'd like first of all beat the guy up or whatever it may be which women don't have the ability to because you know for the most part they're smaller less powerful than men in that respect but secondly as well you don't think about the you know the domino effect of that allegation has on people right it's just it's not just one it's like um you know you don't use it's not a different situation completely but look at the justice smollett situation right look at what that one allegation or that one made up story that he did allegedly made up story that he did and he's completely put the whole cast members out of a job and you really think empire would have got cancelled if he didn't have done if you anyway regardless of what he had done i don't think so empire is one of those corny crappy shows on tv that just you know rinse and repeats just kind of continue churning on as long as they do the adequate amount of numbers viewings numbers wise it's just a thing that would have just continued going and going and going and now look what he's done effectively he has put people out of a job due to his just one selfish act right it's just it's just it really is i don't know man i don't really have any words for it like imagine that being your friend imagine what i'm saying imagine that being your girlfriend and she's telling you that some guy at work that she's working with a co-star on the show is making unwanted sexual advances to her and then she doesn't feel safe or just wants to come on set and be a protector like you, you can't just sit what are you gonna do go there and pretend like you're there to watch her do her show and tape you know i've, I've been an, i've been an extra on tv shows i haven't had any lines but i've been an extra i know how boring it is i know it's not a fun place right so imagine being there and you're the boyfriend and you're not acting and you, you you've got this information in your head you're just sitting there boiling like a fucking kettle raging right anytime that guy has to say something to your girlfriend or has to come near her you're like giving him the death stare he knows he knows what you're there too right men know what's what the deal was they know when um an aggressor's in a room they know it like they feel it in their bones right the girlfriend's also aware of the tension that's existing in the space she knows how quickly the situation can turn really fatal <sighs> Mamma mia, man. Absolute scumbag. Um, hey, this is true, anyway. We got, uh, this is just true. Um, da, 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 da. She went to her boyfriend to come. Um, the source also says, Bone or inf- ultimately informed producers at Fox 21 that she could no longer work with Mitchell. Initially, he was retained while she was released at her request to pursue other projects. Mamma mia. Other actresses on the series also were said to have problems with Mitchell. It's unclear what finally led to the studio to act. It's really interesting, right? Considering how um, nervous studios get with sexual harassment um, allegations, they usually act very quickly and kind of cancel it and kind of get ahead of it before it kind of gets in 
gets into the you know social media conversation because by then when people start picking apart the story and start realizing there was a cover up or people weren't really acting on it, they'd kind of rip them to pieces. So interesting that she made the allegation known. They didn't act on it or they were hesitant to kind of do anything about it. She was so uncomfortable that she wanted to just quit the show and go somewhere else and they released her from her contract. And now they're kind of uh, walking it backwards a bit. It's a very, very interesting scenario. There. I'm not sure what happened there or why it happened that way. But anyway, um, sources also say that the Mitchell had not yet started filming Desperados, a comedy set in Mexico when he was replaced in recent weeks by Lamon Morris, New Girl, which is in us. So that's a come up and a half. A source close to the project, which is learning it. Good Studio Universe's producer Netflix says the producer received specific information which was investigated immediately and thoroughly and dealt with it as quickly as possible. Netflix referred queries to Good Universe which declined to comment. Um, Mitchell 32 was considering a rising star having won accolades for his performances uh, as rapper Easy e in 2015 straight out of Compton. He also appeared in Mad um, Mudbound and Detroit and was a series regular on Lena Waits show The, the Shy. Wait did not respond to a request of comment. UTA, which dropped uh, Mitchell several weeks ago, declined to comment. A source with knowledge of the situation, the agency said, made a very quick decision to drop the actor based on multiple allegations of misconduct. Mamma mia, man. Fucking hell. What a fall from grace. Again, I got no, I got no patience for it. You know, if you're gonna do that to women that you're working with, imagine what you're doing with people that you don't know. That's the thing that I don't really understand. I think there has to be a level of respect for someone. Again, I think you have to be conscious about it, especially you know, just being a good dude with girls that you don't know or girls that you're working with, right? And trying to give them as much respect or as space as they need, because you know how creepo that industry is and for you to do that for somebody is fucking insane but yeah i guess you know the the industry has already made it it's made its decision so that's why sometimes social justice can have some good right in terms of the the things that get stripped away from you when you do such a thing to people um you might not get an, a prison sentence but essentially you get an industry kind of wide prison sentence where you've kind of you know been given the the mark of death by your agent and manager dropping you and now you've been dropped from any kind of up coming shows his money's gonna dry up little by little and this is it's a bad place to be man bad place to be anyway um what else is next here oh megan the stallion fader cover megan the stallion's have had it's had an amazing i don't know six months or so which is always always interesting because you know you what 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 you what we see is the six months leading up to this right we just see her kind of wiling out and being super successful and doing the things that she's doing but no one ever sees the grind that led up to this right you just see the kind of the initial kind of overnight success quote unquote story but you know she's been doing her damn thing for a long long time before all this hype happened but I'm happy that um she's getting a success and she's getting a Detroit native um uh, sorry, um, a Texas native, right? A Texas native, she produced, yeah, she produced, sorry. Uh, a Texas native, an amazing rapper, um, really vulgar <laughs> language and subject matter for the most part, which I'm a big fan of. I think, you know, people like to go on and on about her. Oh, she only raps about, you know, getting with guys and what that malarkey with, right? But I'm the mind it, same way, you know, you're, you're only going to get a certain amount of talk. You're only going to get we talk from Wiz Khalifa. No one complains about that. If she's got her niche, she know what works for her. Let her do it. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. I'm happy to see somebody of her ilk um, doing the thing that she's doing. But yeah, the fader cover that she did recently, um, I love it. Really nice. A good mixture of um, a good mixture of digital and film photography here. Who's the photographer? Uh, Renell. Renell Midorano. Mid 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 is that Thingy Majiggy's um, girlfriend? That might be, right? Is that Thingy Majiggy's girlfriend? Maybe I'll just Google it here and see if that's true. Yeah, that is, yeah. That's Ace That Phone's girlfriend. So, yeah, big up her. She's a really good photographer. So, no wonder that that stuff is really nice. Um, but, yeah, check, check out the uh, Fader cover shoot with um, Megan Stallion. Really good images. I found some people on, online were complaining about it. But, again, th this is film images. With Terry Richardson out of favor and a few other people not, you know, in the ilk anymore. These new people coming up now are the ones taking over and, you know, kind of... Uh, documenting the scene for us as we live and i think these pictures do her real justice man i really recommend you check it out it's a really good uh, feature that kind of covers her come up and you know her place in hip-hop at the moment she's amazing her new album just dropped down fever check that out it's available on all digital streaming platforms but yeah i'm a big fan of the first shoot i think it looks really awesome really um authentic way of her displaying her just like in court here <laughs> yeah i'm a big fan of megan Thee Stallion, man i think she's gonna do big things the next few years she's only gonna develop and get better as she kind of progresses through the industry again and just a very unique voice a very unique approach to doing things and again i'm a big fan of the things that she does so yeah I recommend you check it out a really good fader cover story with one megan Thee Stallion is probably my favorite picture here at the bottom there so pure good these super fake lashes the hair the gold dress on the phone the massive ring the velvet sheets like just yeah pure 
pure um, hood rat chic, man. I fucking love everything about it. Look at that. It's, it's so cool, man. The whole whole fucking photo shoot is amazing. Recommend you check it out. One of my favorites out there. But yeah, Megan Thee Stallion doing a damn thing. Um, what else is on here? Oh, the art of DJing with Dr. Rubenstein. Super amazing um, cover story or a feature that you know. For you, if you guys have listened to the show for a while, you know how much of a fan I am of Dr. Rubenstein. How you know I went to go see her play alongside uh, Roy Perez at Mixed Garage, you know, and my life maybe changed for the better. Reading an interview with her, I kind of discovered her through reading an interview with her um, on um, Electronic Beats to Telecom, that kind of German-based um, online techno magazine. It's really cool. I recommend you check it out. They did a really good feature with her, and she kind of came across like you know, as she kind of came across as a DJ that I'd kind of be a friend with. I'm a big fan of DJs that enjoy themselves, or no, I'm I'm a big fan of DJs who are ravers before they got into DJing. Right, I'm a big fan. Of of the the club kid like i was you know i used to go to all the i used to go to plastic people i used to go to village underground i used to go to all these kind of you know historical um london venues fabric whatever you may be called all back in the day when i first got into electronic music and that's how i kind of discovered my love for it you know understanding there's someone behind the booth dictating the soundscape of the actual room reading the crowd of, you know super well and just delivering on a killer set and then you're like fuck how do i get into that and then you slowly go into the whole warm hole over it but that's where i like to kind of come into it not the kind of producer side and then djing you know to get some you know to get more exposure for your tunes or to make more money i'm in it for the clubbing experience and she's you know a, a quintessential uh, rave who, who turned her passion to dj and again one of my favorites out on the scene now a real good party vibe and the whole feature is really cool um it's uh, resident advisors are djing where they kind of highlight djs and kind of ask them you know go, go into their whole practice how they go about djing how they select their tunes their kind of outlook on life it's a really really good interview um there's a quote on here that i really liked i'm going to read out here that i kind of think um really kind of personified where i'm at, at the moment i think it's a quote about ego See if I can find it. Uh, it was on here. Ego. Yeah, there you go. Um, I think this is a really good uh, point that I wanted to kind of emphasize on here, right? So I've got it here on the screen. You guys to see. But I'll link it for the show notes if you guys listen to it via audio. But here it says, my favorite quote from, the, from uh, the whole interview. The question is, let's say I'm a new DJ. Uh, this is to Dr. Rubenstein, of course. Let's say I'm a new DJ who hasn't played out very much. What would you tell me to do in order to connect to my crowd? And um, Dr. Rubenstein uh, responds, I guess the first thing I would recommend is something I do myself, or at least I try to do every time I DJ. When I enter the DJ booth, I leave my ego outside. It's easy to get wrapped up in trying to show people that you're good, that you that you've got, or that what you've got, or to go look cool or to be admired or praised i try to remember that i am there to serve the party along with the people on the dance floor and the people who work in the club the moment you really make it about not you really make it not about yourself but about the party in general and when you want to make it happen together with others i guess that's how you start to connect with the crowd i realized recently that i had been thinking the way this way implicitly before i play which is amazing quote right because i think there is this thinking especially when you're a new DJ or especially maybe if you're even uh, on the way to becoming a bit more established, there is maybe this idea that you should start to carve your own identity and start to forego what the, what the crowd want in terms of trying to make sure you pursue or you get across your artistic vision of what you want to represent, right? You want to make sure what you're saying is what you're saying unfiltered all the way through. But I do think there's an aspect of DJing similar to, you know, the heady days of studio 51 or the loft in New York, right? Where there was this, you know, there was this idea that they, you were going into spaces and they were going to sh show you or they were going to subject you to a musical journey, right? This is the stuff that I'm into, listen and enjoy. But it also was a bit of a call and response part of it, right? In terms of like reading the crowd, giving them what they want, giving them what they didn't know they didn't want and kind of having that dance, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, which is what is pretty, this, which is what kind of separates it from a gig if you're a band, right? If you're a band, you know for sure, when you go see someone play like the Rolling Stones, they're going to go through some of the hits, they're going to go through some of the new records, but you kind of know where it's going to go. But with a DJ, I think that the added benefit that you have is that you have the ability to kind of riff, right? To kind of go off course a bit and kind of come back on course a bit and kind of, you know, play around a bit. And I just think for me going forward, I've, I've been very conscious of providing, again, of providing a good time, of making sure everyone has a good time because I just know, I know how it is to be on the other side. I know how it is to walk into, especially because the place I'm playing in aren't necessarily nightclubs, right? They're just, you know, random bars in um in um east london and stuff right but um i think i'll do the same with nightclubs anyway i think we've all been random bars and pubs where you d you just went there to go meet a friend you didn't know dj was going to be playing all of a sudden dj starts playing 
and they ruin your night, right? They just start playing too loud. They're playing weird music, stuff that doesn't make sense for the timing. Just, you know, just throws, it throws you off a bit. It's sort of like um, when a really shitty band plays in the pub, right? It just kind of ruins the whole evening, right? They have to be really good, right? This is not, and of course, if you know, if you know, if you know anything about dad pub bands, you know that they're not good, right? They're a bit shit. So you're hoping, so, so you know, it's, it's unlikely you're going to find a, a good one. So then when you do find a good one, playing in a bar or a pub, you're like, fuck, you're appreciative of it because they're not ruining your night. They're an accompaniment to your night. They're adding, they're adding a soundtrack to your evening. They're not just pile driving you with, you know, EDM or dubstep at 9 p.m. In, um, in the evening. They're really trying to guide you through the night. And they actually, essentially, you can tell they're trying to make you stay as long as possible. And that's something I've kind of been really conscious of because I remember in the beginning when they used to play here in Westfield, and I'll start usually from seven. I remember it being like, you know, I remember from seven to nine is where I started to lose people, right? So I had to really thin out the herd. Everyone started to go home. And at one point there was that, you know, common thinking that a lot of st- new stand-up comedians do where if you have a really bad set, there's, you know, and it kind of, you know, it really dents your ego. There's a part of you that's like, oh, man, they don't really get what I'm doing, man. They don't understand my vision. And you kind of poo-poo it and you kind of put it to one side. But there is a, also a part of you that's deep down, you're like, you know what? Then they're, they're going home because I, I did a bad job, right? I did a bad job. I need to understand them more. And I guess over time, as you get more mature as a DJ, you kind of get more confidence, even just an artist, what you do, you start to understand, you start to kind of, you start to um, cultivate a bit of humility, right? You start to understand, okay, I'm not as good as I thought I was. I could be, I, I could be better, but I'm not there at the moment. And sometimes you can be, you can be also good doing your own thing, but I just don't think everyone wants to just to hear your own thing sometimes. It depends what kind of level of artist you are. But I think that, that give and take is something that's beautiful about DJ. So over time, with, with experience and you know, practice, I started to understand, I started to be able to read the room and I started to know what to play in order to make people stay and how to get them to hang around, hang around, hang around a bit more. And if I, even if I take the example and I extrapolate it to the bar in Leightonstone, um, I play there in the in Heathcote and start at nine at nine p.m. Usually I start right nine p.m. to one, and um, where I play is right in the middle of the bar. So on the left hand side is where the games room is, and then outside of the games room is the is the beer garden, right? Um, and obviously with this lovely weather, it's going to be fucking ramp packed. So they usually close the beer garden at ten p.m. So I've got an hour from nine till ten, or let's say an hour and a half, nine till ten thirty to keep those people that are in the beer garden in the pub because usually when they come into the bar they usually just walk straight out and go home right so i have an hour and a half to kind of see how many people from that group of people that walk through the bar can i keep because usually when people when the security guard comes out says hey guys sorry we're going to close the beer garden now people usually got all their stuff with them outside right so they usually what they do is they put their stuff on even if they even if they're going to change their mind and might stay in they put their stuff on and they start walking towards the door so you have to really capture their attention at that that hour and 10 minutes that hour and a half hour and a half and i've been and i've gotten better at doing it over the, over the time i think sometimes i'll start too slow sometimes I, was, I would be a bit too safe but now i know what to play to kind of get their attention and then to kind of keep them there. And again, I think it's something that you only learn with humility, with e- with putting your ego to one side. Because if it was my ego was in the booth, I'd be like, nah, they should get it. When they're walking past, they should understand what I'm playing. This is a fucking deep cut. They should know. You should stay. You can't, you're can't. you not going to hear this stuff anywhere else. But it's like, no, I'm there to serve them, right? And they're there to kind of serve me in some way, right? They're there to give me an idea of whether or not I'm going in the right direction or not. And I think over time, that's been something I've been very, very um, thankful for in terms of the little gigs I've been getting right now at the moment. They're not the most glamorous, they're not the most amazing, they're not the most, you know, crazy places. But what they do give the opportunity is to play every single week in front of a really captive audience, in front of people of a varying, di- varying background, varying different, various, varying uh, um, musical taste. And to try, try and get my kind of knowledge up and skill level up in terms of how to, um, how to um, o- overall kind of appeal to them going forward. And it's something I've kind of been really happy with. And again, I'm happy um, Dr. Rubenstein kind of mentioned the, the fact that, you know, not having an ego is one that's really going to help you go forward. And it's just another thing about drinking, which I'm, I'm something that I struggle with when it comes to DJ, something that I've not kind of got to grips with. But another quote here that was quite interesting, uh, question and quote. I get here on the screen. Uh, the question is, do you use substances to help you get in the zone when you DJ? And she says, no, never. I drink sometimes, but only a little. I let myself have one or two beers if it's not very late. And I know I'm going to have to go to sleep. Time to go to sleep. But I usually just drink water. When I was starting out in Berlin, I didn't have to do to be to i didn't have to be in so in control because my friends was there. So I was comfortable and at home. 
When I started touring, I had a lot of more responsibility. It's a lot of work and a lot of money to organize a party or festival. I want to respect that, which is fucking awesome, right? Um, and I agree, I really do um, agree with that in some regard, right? I think when you start, especially when your friends are booking you. I know for me, when I was playing in Dawson, which I, I don't anymore at the moment, you know, mostly due to um, other extenuating circumstances. And sometimes, you know, due to the fact that I kind of, I ran my course there and kind of, you know, I, I went, went past my cell by date, but... When I used to DJ around those kind of places, you'd go really hard and play the most ludicrous shit because usually, by and large, your friends were the ones that were booking you, right? So you were in a safe environment with your friends that were turning out to pie. There was no real... Um there was no real danger of you doing anything dumb or of, you, of the people not getting what you were playing. But I can imagine the moment you start touring, the moment you start playing in bigger venues, the pressure ramps up a lot because as important as it is, as great as it is that you've got an agent, you've got a manager or that you're getting these big bookings, I'd imagine... DJing is a lot like comedy where there is there is a part of it where you can get far with association, right? With being given the right intro and stuff. But there is a moment where, or there is, there will, there will come a point where if you're not good enough, you just stop getting booked, right? If people don't want to see you, people complain that you're shit, you just won't be good enough anymore, right? There's, you know, we've all seen the amount of DJs out there who kind of became records when they started going becoming successful. And then people started complaining online, especially when resident vibes are comments are open. That's when you could get an idea of how people's acted when they were out DJing. And then you'd get, you kind of see, you know, six months later, the person, the DJ in question would then say, Oh, I'm sober now. I'm trying to concentrate on my music because it reached a point where that stuff starts, stuff, stuff, that sort of substance abuse starts to impact how you do the job but there's also another part of it that's kind of hard to deal with that i don't hear a lot of people talking with is the idea of being in a nightclub playing music especially a dark nightclub um you know it's somewhere in like some god forbidden area completely sober is really difficult around people who are you know drunk and high it's really hard to do and i know for me when i went when i was doing sober october and i was djing every week um, I found it really difficult to kind of, you know, just be, can remain sane in that kind of environment surrounded by so many fucked up people, especially because you're playing for four to six hours or let's say two to four hours a night that I'll usually do. Um, you're having to be around these people all the time. They're coming near you. They have no sense of personal space and shit. Just the usual drunk people stuff, right? It's really hard to kind of stay in the zone or be in state completely sober. You have to have a little tickle. Um, sometimes I'd have a shot or I'd have a, a couple of whiskeys just to kind of make me, just to kind of um, um, smooth the edges. Because you know you know how you are when you're sober and you're in a bar. You're super um, tetchy, right? Um, you're aware of too many things. So you kind of sometimes, and then that can maybe ruin the mood for you and for the people around you. Because people can feel it, right? If you're feeling a little bit, you know, on edge and shit. But I kind of get what she's coming from in terms of, you know, the more sensitive you get, you maybe have to kind of curtail those things going forward. But let's continue with a quote. And she said, also, I need to be, um, I don't need to be wasted to get into the mood because I've been partying for so long. After this many years, it's not hard for me to get in the mood. I'm not saying that I'm always sober, but I don't need to get in the vibe. I'm already in it, which is true, right? I think when you come from a, a raver's point of view, I know for me when I went to, I went to Mixed Garage just the other day and I didn't really drink that much. I got a couple of beers and like I mentioned in the other podcast, you know, they turn to fucking warm custard quite soon after I put them in my pocket like an idiot, you know, of course, your pocket jumping around um, it next to your skin boils and then there you go. You've got a nice little warm IPA in, in your mouth. But I've realized in general, like I don't need to get fucked up or to be high to kind of enjoy a techno party, right? I can, I, I'm there for the music. I'm there for the vibes. I can suddenly get into it just from dancing alone and kind of feeling the beat, closing my eyes, hearing the bass line, hearing how the person's mixing the next song coming in. I, I'm already in the zone. I don't need, I don't need any enhancements. I think, as, I think the problem, the thing that happens when you're a DJ is that you start to get in the zone with the music you're playing. The more prepared you are, I find the more I've got, I made a, a note of the place I'm playing at, what they want to hear, the crowd, the more I start to realize, um, somebody else, that's the more I start to, the more I start to get excited, right? About the place I'm going to play at. Oh, damn, fell over. About, about the place I'm going to play at, the things I'm going to play. I'm just really, really looking forward to it. So that's me in a zone straight away. I don't need to um, enhance myself anymore. And I've always, re and I've realized too, you know, most of the time, if you're, if you are, enhancing yourself with any sort of drugs or alcohol it does kind of you know throw you off course um i've noticed some of my best sets even though it's been annoying to be in the nightclub completely sober have been when i've been completely sober a couple of coca colas in me or maybe a you know a little cheeky zambuca shot or whatever or a little cheeky shot of jägermaster and i'm done i'm ready to go right i'm always 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 ready to go um again i think it's hard in the beginning to do like i said especially playing in bars and clubs it's just a little bit hard to do but i think by and large it's probably the best practice to go forward um she said, uh, look, 
even though I don't seem like a very serious person, I'm very respectable uh, when it comes to my work. I don't want to be drunk and not do my best. When I when I DJ, I want everyone to work together on making things happen the best way. I think I take it seriously, and I want everyone to take it seriously too. Uh, but in the end, it's a party. It's important that everyone lightens up, chills out about things that don't matter and won't ruin the party, which is really true, right? It's a it's a it's a it's a common conversation. We're all having this conversation together, and we will add to. Which is why you know I go on and on about Berlin clubs, about the experience that you have in there, how they treat you, and you know the attention they 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 the amount of attention they put into picking the people that come into the club or don't come into the club there is something about that that obviously leads overall to the actual overall ambiance of the actual space you're in and it makes it that much better and i think that's something i've always been very conscious of and i think if it can play any part in making the night better as being a dj in terms of you know making sure you're well behaved behind the decks and not acting like a fool and you're not super wasted and you're trying to read the room i think it really adds to the ambiance of it i think when someone you know i, I don't think i think the tone gets set when you know you've got really overzealous or overexcited bounces outside you've got a dickhead door person um you've got a, a ridiculous wait time for the cloakroom and then you're coming into the room and you're seeing a dj clanging um obviously you know wasted out of their heads or fucked off or fucked up out of their heads and then it just makes the whole night completely fucked up and i'm not a fan of it although i do say i would say this i'd say being the opposite like being a complete being the same person in the, in the whole room of chaos is a good thing and i think a, a real good example of that is um this dj set i saw recently now um on uh boiler room of um jasper james have you seen that it's a fucking funny set actually let me see if i can find it jasper james is playing in some open air festival somewhere and i think you know he's really popular with the kids i'm, I'm, I'm he might even be in his home country in glasgow or, or scotland wherever he's from um and that's a real good example of somehow being able to operate in a fucked up environment and still be able to keep be on your p's and q's and it'd be an, old, an absolutely amazing video let me see if i can get it up now i think i found it this is a fucking quality 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 video uh, let's see if i can find the actual bit that actually shows everything uh da, da, da. See if I can find it. Where is it? 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 Mm. There are so many people on here just absolutely fucked up their heads. It's probably too much to find. But yeah, let's see here. Look at this. Just. Just. Mad, mad people wasted here, right? Just, you know. Look at. <laughs> look, look how close they are to him. Look, everyone's getting involved. They're trying to get pictures. Jasper James, there he is doing his damn thing, man. Look at it. <laughs> Amazing. I absolutely love it. But yeah, check that out. It's this new set. I think it's on Boiler Room now at the moment. Look how much the camera's shaking. People are absolutely not round. Look what they start. Look, and I think they suddenly get everyone back behind, behind them to kind of get a bit more space. But yeah, thank God for that. <laughs> There's people taking selfies of him on here, but it's really funny. But yeah, anyway, I recommend you check out both things. Um, interview with Dr. Rubenstein and this um, really cool um, Boiler Room session with uh jasper james and of course i want to mention earlier with um god Jansen, man maybe one of the best boilers i've seen in a long 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 time really 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 good amazing one i really recommend you check it out um what else is on the list here rattle through some more things um steve harvey shows got cancelled that's really sad i'm not gonna go on that the, oh robert johnson 20th anniversary awesome um i went there a couple of years ago um, one of the best clubs in the world. I, I, I think it's rated as one of the best clubs in the world, but great sound system overlooking this amazing little river on the outside when you go there to smoke and stuff. There's legendary videos out there on YouTube of uh, Ricardo Villalobos Dixon in the early days playing there. They had an amazing book called Come Into My Kitchen that documented the entire kind of history of the club, you know, from the beginnings up until now. A really amazing archive of, of pictures from all their friends and family that have played in there. A really simple layout of a club. Look, Just look how amazing that looks like layout-wise, right? It's just a simple club, really simply laid out but an amazing sound system really cool people that run it so they've got 20th anniversary coming up and they've got all the big people coming uh playing who are kind of made it popular robert johnson reveals a, a, a full line of a 60 hour marathon birthday party right um it's amazing 60 hour uh, party um the celebration begins on Friday the 28th, right? And goes on for 60 hours, ending on Monday the 1st of July. So it stays open for 24 hours. 
or you know, all around the clock from Fridays and Monday. More than 30 DJs are slotted to play, including residents. Um, IH, Jert, Gerd Janssen, Cedric uh, Dworski, Roman Flug, um, Orson Wells and Max Vase, as well as a number of favourite clubs, club favourites as well as Avalon, Emerson, Dixon, uh, Parame, John Talbot, Nicholas Lotz, Prince Thomas. But yeah, just an amazing um, lineup of artists um, that are on the build there. Just you got them all here listed. Um, Nicholas Lotz, I love the flyers. Well, they always make good flyers. Um, um, what do you call it? Full confession that they, they were the people. They, they, this was the club night that I always used to kind of steal my fly designs ideas from because they make some of the great, great, great flyers. Whoever does a graphic design for me is fucking awesome. But now I kind of you know steal my ideas from public possessions, which I'm sure a lot of people do as well. But yeah, so so many good people playing Secret Sundays, Max Best, John Talbot. Yeah, DJ Slingshot, Dixon. Yeah, too many good people. Um, no, um, no Ricardo, which is annoying. Um, but I guess he's probably too busy with the um, festival season at the moment to kind of be around there. But yeah, really great um set of lineup of DJs. Twenty years of Robert Johnson and long may it continue. And uh, what else do we have here? Oh, do do do. Oh, New Balance and No Vacancy, and these shoes look fucking awesome. They're, I'm not sure when they're meant to come out, but really nice New Balance. I think inspired by an old picture of Steve Jobs. I'm pretty sure I remember seeing a colorway. Of, there's something similar of that uh, from before. Um, so yeah, this uh, again. I'm not sure if this is a thing that they're doing now because you know New Balance are trying to get people are trying to promote this particular model. But you have the model with Stray Raps that came out recently, and a couple of others too. But um, it looks like it might be the model that New Balance are kind of pushing out there into market. I'm not sure if this is a kind of thing they're kind of running behind or there's a campaign towards it. But I'm not mad at it whatsoever. I think there's some apparel as well linked to this too. But No Vacancy in have released um, images of their uh, collaborative New Balance 9990 V3, similar to the one that I showed you the other day from. Stray Stray Rats, um, amazing uh, colorway. Um, you've got that sort of like, what do you say, like an off blue, uh, what's that, sky blue, kind of new buck upper with a navy blue mesh, uh, some black leather, some, is that navy blue? Yeah, navy blue, maybe are they dark navy accents and bright red laces. Again, it it kind of harkens back to the uh, great yesteryears of like great new uh, new New Balance Crooked Tongues collaborations. You remember those when they were just like churning out great New Balance, the great New Balance, great New Balance, really great colorways. No, no, no fuss done. And these kind of remind me of them. Really nice, nicely done. Uh, blue with some red accents here and there at the back of the hill. They've got water and Wi-Fi. Um, really great shoe overall, and there's some clothing linked to it too. Coming up very very soon. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of them. Not sure when they're going to release so far. We haven't had a date. Um, let me go check, let's quickly check the, the Instagram page and see if they've got anything listed on there for the moment, just in case we might see something there. Uh, let's get this off there. Let's cancel. Scroll down. Okay, so a few people have got the shoes already, as you can see here via the Instagram page that I'm on at the moment. This is a new vacancy in Instagram page. They've got a few people who have been seeded a pair at the moment already. We've got a picture here of somebody wearing them. Look amazing with the red laces, right? Um, looks so, so cool there. Uh, you've got another picture of them down with the red laces. And you've got a picture here of Kawhi Leonard wearing a pair. I think he switched laces and had them tonal there. Look awesome as well. Look really, again, really clean, understated look. Oh yeah, he's sponsored by New Balance. And that's probably the reason why he got a pair as well. Um, you've got a picture here, Young Lord looking very excited. It's at Bari, he got a pair as well that he's lacing up. And yeah, just overall, man, just one of my favorite shoes, I think. I'm really, really happy. I'm really excited um, these are coming out and hopefully be able to get a pair. Again, probably not because, you know, limited edition shoes and me don't go well. But hey, I can only try. So let's see. Hopefully they come out very, very soon. No date at the moment set. I don't think we've got a date here at the moment, have we? Not really. So hopefully we get a date very, very soon. But yeah, um, great shoes. Hopefully they come out soon. But yeah, check them out. Um, no vacancy in. Uh, New Balance 999 V3 is coming at you very soon. Um, uh, like that. Let's go back on here. What else do we have? Uh, Fragment Dr. Martins. I'm a big fan of these. Um, I'm sure most people won't because they're going to be extremely expensive and maybe, you know, not probably worth the hype. But again, Hiroshi Fujiwara is one of my, um, icons or one of my, um, you know, someone I look up to immensely, an absolute streetwear godfather, somebody who's kind of, you know, laid their blueprint down for what most people are doing now at the moment in terms of maybe being an influencer and just, you know, being a consultant, a designer, just, you know, someone that's not very easily to be, not easily classifi classifiable, right? You can't really put him in a box. He does most, a lot of things. And one thing that I've always been a big fan of him for is the idea that he's able to jump around from brand to brand and do a little small project because, you know, he's essentially, he's the only one that's able to do that because he's not necessarily, you know, He's all about the taste. He's all about being a good recommender 
of great items and he's got this amazing collaboration out um that's going to come out i think this weekend um a fragment uh a fragment design dr martin's hollingborn derby so it's essentially the low version of the boot right which is the 1461 i think right i think 1460 is the boot wow so mad for my dr martin's knowledge um completely patterned up, up a black pattern leather upper with the little fragment logo embossed on the heel and you got like a and completely black sole too uh the stitching is also black too so completely tonal shoe that i'm a big fan of again reminds me of the reservoir dogs kind of theme which probably goes into the lookbook i'm not too sure if this idea of a lookbook is that great it's kind of looks like he just shot for shooting up in a, in a bathroom but hey ho what do i know um yeah they look amazing something i'd easily wear now at the moment with some you know tailored or some you know some high-waisted shorts some crop trousers sorry, some white socks i think it look awesome with a nice suit jacket or something i think it look great uh big fan of the shoe um again maybe a bit difficult because dr Myers, you've got to break them in a little bit for them to be of any use but i think uh, yeah one of the one of the shoes that i definitely be a, definitely wouldn't mind wearing um they're gonna come out i think this weekend i'm pretty sure it's this weekend uh yeah may 24th so they should have been out today already so if you if you're watching this it's probably too late but yeah fragment design dr Myers. i'm probably they probably won't sell out anyway because i'm i'm sure most people are, you know, going to buy the same old Jordan Retro that they usually buy most of the time. But yeah, one of my favorite shoes out at the moment. Um, again, something that I'd, I'd be more than happy to wear with my suits, which I only have one of. But hey, you know, it's good to say suits because it sounds like you have loads and we don't have any. <laughs> oh, mamma mia. Oh, um, did anyone listen to Igor? That's good. I think um, Tyler Creator's album's out soon as well, isn't it, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um... I'm pretty sure it's out at the moment as well. Tyler Creators, I'm so definitely check that out. But yeah, anyway, um, that's the next show, you know. That's an hour. We've done already an hour. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have the company of you as I've been rambling on and on and on. For those of you watching via the podcast app, uh, for those of you watching via YouTube, um, as always, like and subscribe. You via listening via the uh, audio, please leave me a five star review so people find this show and can discover it and stuff. Um, my schedule can be found on my website, actionazinger.com forward slash DJ gigs. You'll see where I'm playing. Like I said before, it's going to be a crazy couple of days. Loads of bookings coming out my ass, but you know, I'm not complaining anymore. Uh, more than welcome. Um, I think I'm going to set up a separate channel for some of my DJ um, streams that I do sometimes do live streams or sets that I play at home I'm going to set up another channel to do those on I'm going to buy a little rig so I have uh, the camera focusing in on my hands I'm playing I don't really like it on my back it doesn't really look that great to be honest it's not really got a good angle um, I'm going to try to get that up set up as well very soon so be on the lookout for that DJ Handsome Black Man um, YouTube channel coming at you very very soon but before all that and before that happens I'm wishing you a good Friday and a good weekend Hope you have fun. Um, enjoy the sun and all that malarkey, wherever you may be. And I'll speak to you guys again very, very soon. Peace out, people. Bye.